Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Activating the Collective Power of Latinx Engagement and Giving, a Virtuous Circle. For those of you who are returning Foundation Center webinar participants, a warm welcome back. And to those of you uh, here for the first time, I'm really glad that you're joining us today. My name is Julieta Mendez, and I will be supporting today's webinar by managing polls as well as collecting questions that you pose along the way um, and posing them during our Q&A. Um, so now I would like to take a moment to introduce today's presenter. Uh, we're very excited to have with us um, Ana Maria Arguilagos, who's a president and CEO of Hispanics and Philanthropy, and Jose Calderon, who's president of Hispanic Federation. Ana Maria is the president and CEO of Hispanics and Philanthropy, also known as HIP. Um, she has a rich history of working for the nonprofit and public sectors. Her past experience includes uh, being senior advisor at the Ford Foundation as part of the Equitable Development Team. She's also been the Deputy Chief of Staff and Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, she was also Senior Program Officer at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, where she spearheaded the Foundation's work in rural areas, indigenous communities in the U.S.-Mexico border region. And she has had other great roles with the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, as well as National Council of La Raza, and so much more. Um, welcome, Ana Mari. Thank you. And Jose Calderon is President of Hispanics, uh, I'm sorry, of the Hispanic Federation the nation's premier Latinx nonprofit membership organization. Mr. Calderon manages the organization's overall operations with a primary focus on public policy advocacy, strategic planning, program development, and resource expansion. Welcome, Jose. We're, glad, uh, we're happy to have you here today. Gracias, Julieta. So what we're going to be covering today uh, during our webinar, essentially we're going to be focusing on three main topics the importance of and the relationship between civic, civic engagement and giving in the Latino community, uh, trends from the new landscape of Latino giving to build your engagement plan, and finally, strategies and tools to engage Latino philanthropists in your mission. Okay? Um, but before we jump into today's conversation, we want to hear from you, from our audience. So please respond to our first polling question, uh, which asks, uh, which of the following best describes you? All right. So the results say 58% of you um, are uh, from an organization that is actively working with the Latinx community. That's wonderful. 17% are, are from organizations that are considering working with the Latinx community. 64% of you are here on behalf of, an, of a nonprofit organization, and 14% are here on behalf of funders. Wonderful. It seems that we have a really good mix of people in the audience. Thank you so much for, for joining us today, and we hope that you find this webinar um, very informative and very helpful in the work that you're going to be doing. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, Ana Maria and Jose, uh, to help us set the stage for this conversation, can you please share a bit of the history of Latinx philanthropy in the United States? How did it develop? What has been its journey? Where are we now? Um, and if you can please also comment on the role that both Hispanics in philanthropy and the Hispanic Federation have played in activating Latinx philanthropy. Sure. Who goes first? I think you do. Okay. <laughs> Ladies first. What a gentleman. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Um, so, Hispanics and Philanthropy, we've been around for 35 years. As Julieta said, I've been around for six months, so just the very last portion. But um, really instrumental for me having come into philanthropy as a mid-career person, having worked already in uh, community organizations and, co and, and coming into philanthropy, I can really appreciate what HIP's first 35 years was about and how it started, which was really being supportive to the very, very few Latinos 
that we saw in philanthropy. Today, we see about 10% are the numbers, according to Foundation Center data, actually, mm -hmm. uh, of Latino program officers in philanthropy. But back then, when it started, our founder, uh, Luz Vega Marquis, who is the president and CEO of the Marguerite Casey Foundation, called it Hispanic in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So it really was about seeking out uh, the few Latinos that were in philanthropy, understanding that if you were able to uh, connect them to funders, uh, folks that were from the community would be able to solve problems in a much smarter, more durable, lasting way. Mm -hmm. If you have people that are from the community also advising on the solutions. Mm -hmm. It did pivot about 20, I guess 25 <coughs> years ago mm -hmm. um, in that understanding that only a, a strategy that was about connecting Latinos within the sector and building a support network and a network was not going to be strong enough mm -hmm. of a strategy mm -hmm. that um, the community was growing and so that we had to strengthen the network while also getting concurrently more funding into the communities and that's when HIP started the funders collaborative, mm -hmm. it started a variety of different funds like the unaccompanied minors um, and we started our crowdfunding um, site uh, mm -hmm. with the intention of starting to build infrastructure where everybody could be seeing themselves as givers, mm -hmm. as bold givers, as strong givers, and really connecting, aggregating, and accelerating that whole process so that we could be doing it better. Yeah, so well, quick. thank you, Anna Marie. Um, well, I tell you, we're a little younger than, than HIP, but, you know, we, we started 28 years ago under the premise that uh, we had huge challenges in our community. The fact is that we had, when we looked at the Latino nonprofit sector, it was undercapitalized, under-resourced, under-staffed, under-appreciated, and we needed an entity that was going to fight on its behalf and really be able to raise money locally to support local Hispanic causes. And, and we set out to do just that. Uh, we ended up uh, as sort of as we were going through this mission of how do we increase Latino giving uh, in traditional philanthropy, right? Latinos are givers, right? I mean, we are a very generous people. Uh, we give a great deal to our families principally, obviously send money back home, um, really a lot of money to churches. And when emergencies strike in our community or outside of our community, we're the first in line, right? Mm -hmm. So any natural disaster has been our experience. Latinos uh, give much more than they have, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been the history. But in terms of supporting Latino community-based organizations, that was foreign to them, right? They didn't come from that tradition back home. And so we wanted to have, uh, you know, just the, the level of education that we needed to have with uh, Latinos uh, in, in different stages of their evolution, right? Whether it's Latinos who were in Wall Street or Latinos that, uh, you know, uh, were working in a hair salon, that everyone had a role to play in terms of giving. And so we've been doing that for the past 28 years and raising money uh, not only from Latino individuals, but obviously Lat Lat Latinos in the private sector or corporations, uh, government, foundations, et cetera. And, and the great news is that uh, we have raised $50 million over that period of time to regrant to Latino community-based organizations. Now a lot more work needs to happen, right? And, and I would tell you there has been progress clearly, uh, and I'll share more about sort of our progress internally, mm -hmm. but clearly we have a long ways to go. And, and part of uh, our reality is still that we are undercapitalized and we're under-resourced when we think about the issues uh, that are impacting our community, not just immigration, but certainly around the education gap when we think about uh, lack of access to health care, when we think about uh, economic opportunities, et cetera. All of that, in our view, has to run through Latino community-based organizations. Mm -hmm. They are our most important institutions, mm -hmm. and the fact is today that they, stro they still struggle, right, mm -hmm. to be able to get the resources they need to be able to have an impact on our community. So a lot of work to be done, um, and yet, obviously, some progress over this period of time. Do you have anything else that you want to add, Ana Marie? Yep. <laughs> you said it all. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is the importance of in the relationship between civic engagement and giving in the Latino community? And you touched on it a little bit right now, Jose. Um, the Latino community is a very giving community. They mostly give to churches. They mostly give to back and remittances back home to, to their um, communities in, in Latin America. Uh, how can we kind of translate that type of giving to the U.S., as you well suggested a, a, a moment ago, um, and how can we engage 
Latinos more civically here? Um, and what is that relationship? I have an answer for that yes. one. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> If you look at the funding of Latino institutions for civic engagement, it's going to be minuscule. Mm -hmm. And then we're asked, or we're, why doesn't the Latino community vote? <laughs> why doesn't the Latino community register? It's because the vast majority of money <coughs> is sprinkled in like fairy dust. Absolutely. And people parachute in at the last moment. Instead of doing that kind of work year round, all year long. So what happens? It's mm -hmm. like boom and bust. Mm -hmm. And our Latino community foundation organizations, like Jose has said, are struggling to get the basics done to provide the services, whether they be education related, after school, health, housing, and so. You're asking them to do extra stuff, which they want to do because they understand the importance. But the money and the people parachuting at the last moment, and it's very transactional, is not integrated every day with what people care about on the ground, how it affects their lives. And then we wonder why are, are people not voting? Mm -hmm. It's because they distrust, because honestly, this looks pandering, it looks transactional. And it doesn't look like how this is being done is being done for the long term. So there's a new, you know, strategy mm -hmm. that I am really intrigued. Um, with, it's called integrative voter outreach or integrative voter engagement, which I love what it is, except for the title because the title like <laughs> signals, a title. Yeah, signals you back to that. It's all about voting, but I think it's all about meeting people where they are mm -hmm. and meeting the organizations where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we'll have a lot more success if we try and work it in that way because Latinos are very civically engaged, but they haven't been given the same launching pads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so Ana Mari is, is absolutely right. I mean, we are often the last to know about everything in our community. Uh, you know, information trickles down literally to us. And so when we have uh, races, when we have candidates, uh, we are an afterthought. And that needs to fundamentally change, and particularly around the resource allocation of this. We matter as a community every four years or every two years, right, when we have midterm elections, that there's a large percentage of Latinos in a certain district. And so now all of a sudden, the powers that be care about us, right? Uh, for us, Latino civic engagement has to be done on a daily basis, as Ana Mari said, right? Uh, every single day we have to invest and build that. If we don't, we're going to continuously fail, right? So this idea of parachuting into communities every four years, building something and then destroying it and say, okay, we're going to rebuild it every four years, clearly doesn't work. It's not the way to build sustainability around anything that you do in life, but certainly around civic engagement. Uh, we are at this particular moment in American history, it's a perilous time to be Latino, to be a person of color in this country. And 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 here is an opportunity for us, right? When the people, the values, the rights that we stand for and fight for as a community are under serious threat, uh, we have this unique opportunity to engage Latinos in a relevant way where they can see how uh, the policies of our federal government are impacting them, their families, and in our communities, but we have to be able to engage them in an authentic way, and it has to be resourced. I mean, we are talking about philanthropy, so I think it's important to always have that lens. We cannot be expected to turn out our community, to educate our community, to make sure that they are informed if we are an afterthought when it comes to resource allocation. The reality is that right before an election, let's say we end up getting money for voter registration in August, right, with, you know, a few days before the voter registration deadline, mm -hmm. or we'll get out, you know, money for the GOTV um, the days before, the weeks before the actual election. It doesn't work that way, right? Nothing works that way. And so it has to be thoughtful, it has to be strategic, and we need to do a better job also as Latino leaders to be able to engage our community around the conversation around self-determination. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, others need to support our work, clearly that's important, but we also need to invest in our institutions at home, right? We need to be able to say, hey, this local institution is really important because not only are they providing uh, after-school tutoring to my kid or helping my grandmother with housing assistance or helping us with an ICE case, God forbid, but they're also organizing the community and they're making sure that we're marching or rallying uh, and then we're active and they need resources to be able to do that. Um, our organizations struggle 
so mightily just to provide social services, right? And that's a, an ongoing challenge. But I would argue that the social service component, as important as it is, is still just band-aid prescriptions. We are not getting to the root of the problems. We get to the root of the problems by making sure our people are engaged, our people are voting, to make sure that we have a voice at the table when it comes to policy making mm -hmm. in this country. And so clearly, again, uh, this conversation we're having today is so critically important because we need to be active philanthropists. Uh, we need to educate our community about doing that, but also making sure that whether it's the private sector, whether it's the foundation sector, or whether it's government, that they're giving us our fair share to be able to empower our community. Mm -hmm. That said, we've been self-funding a lot of this work, yeah. and we talked about it a little bit earlier. The giving circles that are cropping up all over the country, and Jose, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that. We funded some of them in Arizona and San Diego, um, up in Boston, really fantastic, where people are giving of their own paychecks, of their own resources, and use that as an opportunity mm -hmm. to get more involved. Mm -hmm. um, crowdfunding, again, they have to, they're learning about what's happening in their communities, in their backyard, and the community is, is big, right? Because, for example, our crowdfunding site, Hip Give, uh, you can fund in your own literal backyard, or you can fund in Guatemala, or like, in San Diego, Tijuana, now with the famine separation crisis. So it gives people an opportunity to understand and to get more involved with their resources. And again, I'd love for you to talk about like what you guys did, which was so incredible, I'll say, um, around the um, the hurricane sure. uh, response after Maria. Uh, we had our crowdfunding site. We were happy that we raised $600,000, which mm -hmm. was, I thought, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but that also reflected you know what you guys were able to do and how you're putting resources back into the ground that's fantastic as well i like to say it's really fertile and all of these ways that uh, latinos are giving that's aggregating and there's more and more ways and that's um it, as our numbers grow in terms of mm -hmm. the population right now we're 18 percent and that's trending up and our buying power is going up as well mm -hmm. right now 1.4 trillion we're harnessing the power of that disposable mm -hmm. income even if it's 0.1 percent right you still have 10 billion dollars a year that can be harnessed channeled into the into uh, improving the community into health and jobs and starting businesses and really security for our families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, no, thank you, Ana Marie. But philanthropy, like anything else, has to be accessible to the people. You have to be able to sort of, again, get to, uh, you know, the people that you want to engage in and you want to connect with. Uh, it hasn't been traditionally, right, in, in our community. And so, you know, these tools now through social media, through crowdfunding, uh, through these uh, giving circles, makes it more accessible for our community to give. Uh, for uh, you know, the disaster in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria on September 20th uh, last year, uh, we set about uh, raising as much money as we could to the people of Puerto Rico, right? Those are our people. Uh, you know, again, uh, what happened there was personal for us. And it was personal for a lot of Latinos, right? Uh, whether you were Puerto Rican or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, people wanted to make sure that they gave. And traditionally, right, when you think about giving in natural disasters, you think of the American Red Cross. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm going to check off the box, and that's where I'm going to give. Um, our community demanded more of that because they, we understood, right, as, you know, great work as, as the American Red Cross does, that this was about a long-term involvement in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and that this was not only going to be sort of a relief mission, but it was going to be a recovery, you know, mission as well, too, that we were going to have to figure out what we were going to do with the energy system in Puerto Rico, the, the, the housing that was going to uh, n needed to be reimagined, long-term education, uh, health care, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted to invest in an institution that had accountability to the community. And so we were very fortunate to be in the position of raising a great deal of money on behalf of the community, on behalf of our people of Puerto Rico. And we wanted to make it accessible to them. I think Ana Marie's point is we started, uh, you know, through our website, opening up opportunities that if you wanted Julieta to do a birthday party in honor of the people of Puerto Rico and raise money that way, that you could do it through our website and people could donate there, right? And do that uh, if you wanted to have the local community come together and you were going to have, uh, you know, just uh, a cooking party, right? That you can do that through the website and you can do that through a crowd funding uh, mechanism where you could raise money. We ultimately ended up raising over $40 million uh, wow. doing that work, right? We had great ambassadors like Lin Manuel Miranda, but really it was ordinary people mm -hmm. who were giving, right? And, and it's amazing to me is uh, this, this fact, 
that we raise just as much money in California as we raised in New York, mm -hmm. right? So New York being sort of the, the, the hub of the Puerto Rican community, right? Traditionally, politically, socially, economically. Um, and California, right? Obviously, we have Puerto Ricans there. But it was really, again, the outpouring of not only Puerto Ricans, Right, the Puerto Rican diaspora, but it was Latinos in California throughout. But it was also regular Americans who said, you know, what is happening in Puerto Rico is not uh, is not right. Right, obviously mm -hmm. in terms of the response of our federal government, um, and we need to step up. And here we have a mechanism to be able to do so. So as much as we can make philanthropy or giving accessible to our people, uh, the better off we're going to be. And so we're learning as we go mm -hmm. now. Uh, you know, it's a great story about raíces in the border around family separation and incarceration. It was a crowdfunding sort of mm -hmm. uh, source, right? I think mm -hmm. within the matter of a couple of days, they ended up raising $20 million. Right. There is the power of giving, right? And involving others, right? Latinos and non-Latinos alike, mm -hmm. to be able to support our causes. And that's really important and exciting, I think, for the movement. And I talk about our movement as a Latino empowerment movement, uh, but as a people of color movement generally. Yep. I have I, a oh, go, yep. go ahead, Emily. That really speaks to the if you give the community the strategies, the tools, and the mm -hmm. resources mm -hmm. to be able to give, they will step up. They are giving. I think that before the past couple of years, that wasn't, I call it democracy democratizing philanthropy. It wasn't democratic. Mm -hmm. It wasn't accessible. And our folks are very giving, but they're also very relational mm -hmm. as a community. Mm -hmm. And so what Jose and I are doing is building infrastructure so that people can give, again, so conserving that relationship and that need and that desire to give back to the community and to be engaged, but in ways that are culturally relevant and culturally sensitive. Right. The big foundations that we see today, these are institutions that were built in this country, in the U.S., which actually Latinos are, have been in this country for 500 years. Mm -hmm. um, but these particular institutions, community uh, foundations, uh, were built um, you know, by the Carnegie's, the Rockefellers, the Fords, okay. and it was with a certain intention in mind, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a lot around tax deduction, around preserving legacy. Latinos usually don't give necessarily. The primary focus is not a tax deduction. A lot of our giving is without the expectation exactly. of a tax deduction sure. form. Mm -hmm. So we are doing it with the true sense of the word philanthropy, which is love of humanity, mm -hmm. love for your brother, your sister, your neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're developing is ways to give that are relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, the giving circles is one way. Right now we're playing um, with digital giving circles, for mm -hmm. example, given that we have the Hip Give website. And a lot of the grassroots organizations that are often run by one or two persons are often rural. Sometimes they're actually even all volunteer run, don't have access to a development consultant. How do they market themselves? How do they um, raise resources? Mm -hmm. Crowdfunding is super Absolutely. great. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this bilingual crowdfunding site, which really has helped, and it's mm -hmm. uh, across the Americas. So one step up is digital giving circles. Um, but I think that what we're trying to do is figure out the, how can we develop, a, you know, strong, impactful, bold infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, and we're inviting your listeners uh, to help us figure that out, mm -hmm. because what works in uh, New York often works in California, but, you know, it might have a different twist. We might right. need to, so so we're we're literally flying this airplane of Latino <laughs> City as right. we're flying, uh, you know, we're flying right. it as we're right. developing it, but that's fine, but uh, the trends for the community are that the community is growing, and so we really do need to look right. at this. Um, and we definitely, we're gonna get to that question about tools and strategies. I do wanna dive deeper into what you have just said, though, and I think this is gonna be important for the audience. Um, and really understanding the nuances of what drives the Latino community to give and who gives, because as Ana Maris, as you just stated, you know, Latinos don't give to get the tax deduction, right? right? It's uh, not the driving. It's not the driving. Yeah, I'm, I'm, exactly. I'm sure there's plenty of folks. Who right. It's hard exactly. to generalize. Exactly. But we give for other reasons as well, as do yes. many others. We're just yes. very relational. Mm -hmm. And then the other aspect okay. is that, um, you know, it, typically philanthropy is seen as something that comes from the very wealthy, Correct. right? And the Latino community defies that. We have people that have uh, almost nothing and they still give 
either through remittances or through the church or in other ways, right? So, um, what what drives the Latino community to give, and who gives? Who who's giving? So, so I think it's a great question, right? And and you know, obviously, all of us have. Uh, been thinking about this for a really long period of time. I mean, again, we were created to sort of, again, figure this out, right? Sort of get, figure out this puzzle, right? About how do we get Latinos to give and how do we make sure that we get, uh, you know, sectors to, to support our community. I would tell you in part, this is incredibly personal for Latinos, right? Mm -hmm. We give because it's a personal thing. It matters to us. Family separations matter to us. Family incarcerations matter to us. Right? Obviously, uh, we are, you know, sons and daughters of immigrants or, you know, they're certainly prominent within our neighborhoods, et cetera. We understand the plight, right, and, and the challenges of being an immigrant. We also understand when a Puerto Rico happens that this is about our community, right, whether you're Puerto Rican or not, right? We know we have been in those shoes and that uh, it is uh, ingrained in us. Actually, it's ingrained in us, right? And sort of this notion I think about when, when you know, my parents are Dominican and we grew up and we grew up incredibly poor, but whatever we had in the refrigerator and didn't have in the refrigerator, we figured out if we had visitors, right? right? I was, you know, told to go run to the store to buy with whatever little money we have so we could offer our, our visitors uh, what we didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very much, uh, uh, you know, ingrained in, in the Latino culture. It's who we are. Um, and in this moment in time right now, there are so many things that are personal to us. Mm -hmm. because we see these relentless attacks on our community, right, uh, almost on a daily basis, the ugly rhetoric around who we are and what we are and, 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 and what we contribute to this country, right, uh, always painted in a negative light. Uh, we see how things are being, rights are being taken from us, right, we see how uh, there are all these cutbacks on, in terms of health care, in terms of education, et cetera, and we very much know that it's, these are direct assaults not only on us, right, as individuals, as, as adults, but on our future, which are our children, right? Mm -hmm. And for us, this is very personal. And so this is uh, this unique moment in time where we can uh, take that next leap, if you will, mm -hmm. right, to make sure that uh, Latinos who very much want to get engaged, I mean, and, and, and again, we have marches and rallies all throughout this country, right? And we are uh, by far the community that, that is out there the most, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's turning that, right, those actions, into this other piece, which is really important, which is now give as well too, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, we want you to march, we want you to rally, we want you to, you know, again, come with us to see these congressional members, but we also need you to support these institutions that serve as the backbone of mm -hmm. our ability to be able to fight back and push back and resist. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you're starting to see that. You saw that in the response around Puerto Rico. You're seeing that in the response to family separations and incarceration. And I think you're going to continue to see it if we do our job right, Ana Marie, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, our next question, I'm going to move right along right before, and then we'll get to strategies and tools in just a minute. Um, so let's talk about practical strategies for engagement, right? So what are some of these innovative practices? And you've already touched a little bit on it, but what are some of the innovative practices that uh, organizations can use to engage the Latinx community to ensure that they're cultivating the new generation of Latinx civic leaders and philanthropists. I'll jump in. I'll jump in. I think we've talked a little bit about uh, some of these things, Julieta. But I, but I do think it's about uh, the engagement part that you mentioned. It's inherent in that word, right? It is about uh, volunteer opportunities, right? And volunteer opportunities to me, it's like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to have this rally in Washington, D.C. to protest this, right? Well, that's a list right, of people already that, you know, you are offering something to because they very much want to be active. They very much want to make sure that their voice is heard. You're allowing that to happen. And now you have to figure out how do we engage these, uh, you know, these activists, right, these young activists, these people who are outraged or, you know, or feel indignant about what's, what's taking place. They need to be converted into donors. Mm -hmm. I, I tell you, in our experience with uh, the Puerto Rico relief and recovery efforts, uh, like I mentioned, we raised $40 million. And so the challenge that we knew is like, okay, this is amazing. It's $40 million. But that's, those $40 million are going back to where they need to go, right, to the people of Puerto Rico. And we made a commitment uh, initially for the first six months that 100% of the money that we collected was going to the people of Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. right? And then afterwards, it's like, okay, 93% of the money that we collect is, is going to the people of Puerto Rico. Um, but still, the challenge that we have was like, how do we convert these donors into supporters of the Hispanic Federation and our mission, which is broad, right? It's not just about Puerto Rico, as important as Puerto Rico is. Um, and right now, this year, the great news for us is that we have been able to raise now $2.5 million in general uh, op money 
from donors, largely from that initial pool of, of donors around Puerto Rico. We've been able to convert them to support our mission broadly. That's allowed us to be super active around family separation and incarceration. It's allowed us to be super active on so many other issues. And so that is uh, a challenge for us, right, because we don't have these huge development departments, right, um, to be able to do that. But I would tell you that with uh, some investment from our part, uh, but limited at that, we were able to start, again, taking the people who are volunteering around our marches, our rallies, our organizing generally, uh, our voters, if you will, to become active donors of our organization. And I think that that is critical that we do that. Wonderful. And Amadi, earlier you were talking about how uh, Hispanics in Philanthropy has really been able to leverage um, giving circles um, and crowd fundraising sites, uh, bilingual cross fundraising sites as a way to engage uh, Latinos to give. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about what the experience of Hispanics in Philanthropy was? How did you begin to engage um, the community to give? How did you motivate them to actually come to your site? Uh, and, and give and, and participate. Sure, and Jose can talk a little bit about this because he's the national chairman of the National Latino Funds Alliance, which is doing that as well. Um, but what we saw was this divide in, in how philanthropy, and since we use the word philanthropy, it's complicated because we're using the word philanthropy both for institutional philanthropy, which is the foundation and how foundations are giving, and within that you have like the big private foundations and you have the community foundations, you have corporate foundations. Mm -hmm. So you're wrapping all of that in the same word that you're, you, that you're actually also talking about individual giving and individual mm -hmm. philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So it's important to distinguish between those. In one respect, philanthropy has forgotten, and we talked about it in the very beginning, um, only 4% of institutional philanthropy goes to Latinos, four, single digit, even mm -hmm. though we're 18% of the, of, of the population. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge mismatch, and, a, and um, that's, in essence, a problem. Um, because it's a disgrace, actually, mm -hmm. and how do you get at that? And um, that's not, that doesn't vary by geography, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's underfunded everywhere. Um, with little blips like Puerto Rico, actually, Puerto Rico, a lot of money went to Puerto Rico, but not because philanthropy uh, it stepped up. It was yeah. individual, individual. Right? So there's, yeah. there's a, you have to distinguish there. And when you're asking me then, in terms of individual giving, yes, the community has self-funded. And um, the first ways that we started were like with the giving circles or like the tandas, right, is the way mm, you call tandas, them. Yes. Yeah, because that we saw that that was a way that people were funding to be able to pay for the quinceañeras or the refrigerator or the vacation, so it was already culturally relevant. And so we then changed the concept of standards um, into giving, and it's really taken off. I think the best example is our friend Jackie Garcel, who's running the Latino Community Foundation in, in California and is doing amazing work and really connecting the giving to civic engagement. Um, so. I've been talking to community foundations across the country, and actually light bulbs are taking off because they think of giving circles as the ladies who lunch, mm -hmm. who get together mm -hmm. once a month right. or once a quarter to feel good about their giving, and um, they, they're seeing it as a high resource intensive way to, uh, that actually a lot of them are cutting the giving circles off, but I said, okay, for the ladies who lunch, they have other options. They have other ways of coming into the community foundation and understanding what mm -hmm. you're doing and becoming friends, become, coming mm -hmm. into relationships. But for our community who doesn't trust you, who's never heard of you, who doesn't understand what mm -hmm. you're doing, this is a targeted approach that is actually fantastic and makes a lot of sense. And they're like, oh, they didn't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. um, also running different funds, um, small funds. Right now we're having the funds for the family separation crisis for emergency response. I think that we always want to do things around that as well. Um, 
Tell us more about the tanda. That's really, that's a very fascinating concept. Yeah, so just so that yeah. anyone who's not familiar in our audience with what tanda is, maybe they can understand it a little more. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of the idea of, of people coming together, right, uh, to be able to, um, you know, address whatever, what, what, sort of a take care or, or fund something that, that's needed. Uh, we're a very communal people. I mean, we, uh, you know, it's part of our DNA, if you will, uh, to come together. I mean, we, I remember having a conversation, uh, moons ago about mental health and, and, and sort of being able to get, um, there's such a stigma around mental health and getting people to talk about sort of their mental health issues and, and, and needs. And the best way of doing that in our community, is the, it applies to the Asian community as well too, is to actually do it, uh, with groups of people as opposed to, let's say, with the Anglo community where it's like, that's a very private, you know, individual conversation for us. It helps to have people around and I think, the concept around philanthropy works the same way, where it's coming together um, to sort of, again, figure out how do we address a need, right, uh, you know, or, or, or an interest or an aspiration that we have, and and giving circles really uh, is predicated on that, right, that, we, you know, me and you, Julieta, care and, and Ana Marie care deeply about a certain issue. We come together with like-minded people uh, to raise money to be able to support it. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion of concentric circles, you think about right around uh, philanthropy in general, how do we raise more money? Well, it's very much that same way, but right? how do we get more people involved in our work um, and provide a greater capacity to be able to raise much needed resources? Uh, you know, Ana Marie mentioned Latino Community Foundation in San Francisco. Um, they've, they've just done this better than anybody else. They've dedicated a lot of time and resources to be able to do that. And you have active giving circles uh, where people are at, right? Mm -hmm. So you have uh, Hispanic employee resource groups, right, let's say in, in corporate America, that are creating their own giving circles to be able to address this issue. But it's like also our, you know, our madrinas or our abuelitas, right, or our compadres mm -hmm. who are saying we're going to create something similar around this issue. You've seen that historically in the Mexican community where mm -hmm. um, the, these hometown associations mm -hmm. come together and say we want to fix the the placita in our in our in our hometown mm -hmm. in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Clearly, government's never going to get around to it, right? Mm -hmm. And so here we have uh, everybody from this same town. Mention any town in in Mexico, right? Let's say Tijuana, right? And we're going to do that, and we're going to come together with people who are from that town to raise that money to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you see uh, everything that we have talked about. That philanthropy or giving has to be personal. It is, it is personal. It's all relational, right? Mm -hmm. It's relational at the foundation level. It's re relational at the corporate level, but it's also relational people to people. Mm -hmm. And that works particularly well for us as a community because we are a communal people. Mm -hmm. And it is about providing that vehicle for them to sort of rally around the particular cause. And you see the direct impact because what it does is you raise money mm -hmm. and then there is a direct uh, you know, issue that you're tackling. In this right. case, we're going to build that platita, or in this case, we're going to give these scholarships, right, to these people. And it's a great or extraordinary way for people to feel that they're making a difference as opposed to sending their money and they're not sure how it ends up being translated into the cause that they care about. Right, that's right. So with the tanda, they were usually built up, used. everybody puts in their money, and then one month, you get the pot, the next month you, the other one gets the pot, the next month the other one gets the pot. Instead of buying something that you need and being yeah. using it as a way to fund your needs your for home, you're using that standard model to fund so we the club and good. I, I, you, right? you lost me there for a second because we, we say it differently here. Oh. In, in, in New York, we, we call it La Sociedad. So I actually grew up around oh, this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here in New York City yeah. where in, you know, in the Bronx, let's say, um, you know, God forbid, you had a death in the family. Now all of a sudden you needed to yeah. go bury your loved one. You didn't have the money or you need yeah. to go back to Puerto Rico or Dominican Republic, wherever it was. And you did that around your neighbors. And so everybody put up $100, right? There's 100 neighbors where all of a sudden you had, you know, $10,000 to be able to do that. And then your commitment is that you're going to do that every week, right, moving mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. And because our community is so uh, under finance, where we have, you know, again, unbanked, we have so, such a large unbanked community. That was the way to get access to capital. It's like a micro loan. Exactly. Within the, within the, within the, right. within the yeah. community. Yeah. Uh, you know, bad things, you don't earn in, interest around this, but it was a quick way right. of getting money to address yeah. some, some urgent matter, whatever exactly. it was. Yeah. So you're using the same model to fund the common good, to fund your giving in your own community institutions right. and in, in community infrastructures since philanthropy has left these communities behind, 
we are funding. Fascinating. Yeah. We're going to take just a quick moment to check in with our audience. Yeah. Uh, we have a poll here, a poll, polling question that we would like for them to respond to before we continue. Uh, the question is, what challenges have you experienced in engaging the Latinx community that you work with? You know, one of the ways to get philanthropy responding, I'll take this moment, um, to Latino issues more effectively is by getting more people into the pipeline to be CEOs and to be trustees. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the strategies that we have at HIP that maybe some of your listeners might be interesting is our leadership program, mm -hmm. which gets people ready and prepared to be program officers to be CEOs if they're already in the sector and to be trustees. Okay. I said 4% um, of funding goes to Latinx, Latino-led, uh, Latino-serving organizations, but that's because only 10% of program officers are Latino, mm -hmm. and it drops down to 2% and 3% um, at the CEO and trustee level. Yeah. That means that people, that's why people reach out to us, mm -hmm. uh, to help do that matchmaking, to help illustrate and put a, a spotlight on what's happening in the community and understand uh, where they should be funding. But I think that the pipeline of talent needs to be addressed, and those of you listeners that are interested in this, um, HIP does it, uh, but also our colleagues in other communities, um, organizations addressing communities of color like uh, the Association for Black Foundation Executives, Native Americans and Philanthropy, yeah. um, Asian um, community also does it as well. So I think that we need to look, we're talking a lot today about the resources out into the community, but there's lots of ways to get smart about that pipeline in. Mm -hmm. So we have our, our thank you, Ana Marie, for that. We have our, our poll responses. 85% of you said that you are um, identifying uh, the best vehicle to communicate. 3% said that uh, what you struggle with the most are uh, language barriers. 12% say that uh, you really struggle around scheduling programming that works with your schedules. Um, and in terms of other, uh, we have here uh, one of our, one of our uh, audience members indicates that when striving to be an inclusive model for a diverse community, which Latinos are, finding programming and value proposition that meets interests for many uh, is a challenge. So we do a disservice to ourselves when we forget our own diversity. Yes, that is a great, great uh, uh, observation. Thank you. For sharing that, and we will actually get to um, get to that in just a minute. Uh, so I'm going to move along here because we do have um, just a few more minutes. Uh, we talked a little bit about how philanthropy plays out in various parts of the U.S. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add in terms of, you know, uh, what philanthropy, Latino giving, rather, I, I, I won't call it philanthropy, I'll call it Latino okay. giving, what Latino giving looks like uh, in California and Chicago um, versus in other parts of uh, the country or in other regions uh, where, you know, it, it hasn't been as um, successful, let's say, as, as in California and Chicago, so like Puerto Rico or the U.S.-Mexico border region. And what has contributed to this growth? For I that push era? you back on that, Julieta. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe it's just not been written about and studied. Okay, that's Definitely, mm -hmm. journalists and media doesn't pick up on these stories. But as we started the conversation, uh, Latinos are giving. Whether mm -hmm. you look at the mm -hmm. frontera, mm -hmm. I was in Brownsville, Texas, just recently, and if you look at an organization like Lupe, La Unión del Pueblo Entero, those folks, mm -hmm. mean, often you see that the poorest people are the ones that are giving the most. If you look at the relative proportion of what they're earning to what they're giving, mm -hmm. um, so they just need to be. You need to reach out to them mm -hmm. and do it in ways that are um, friendly and culturally sensitive. Um, and and so I guess towards the person, whoever was asking about what are the best communication vehicles, that would be then a, a question for us. Like how do you, given that we know that Latinos are giving and they're giving at higher percentages, um, 
how to do that if you're an organization that doesn't have any Latinos on staff that would then be able to be a messenger. That I, I think is a question I'm hearing, your audience. Hmm. And Jose, yeah, okay. you... so this person was, the, in the poll, they were basically indicating that um, they struggled to find the best uh, communication vehicles to reach their targets, right? So maybe it's not always social media because not everyone, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the abuelita mm -hmm. doesn't maybe won't have social media. Maybe she will. Who maybe knows? Will. <laughs> yeah. It can surprise you now. Yeah. Um, so what are those those vehicles that have proven to be most successful um, to yeah, communicate? Yeah, so you know what? I, I, I'm a firm believer of sort of reaching community where, where they're at, and, mm -hmm. and I know uh, it's a little bit of a, a struggle these days, right? Uh, and, and social media seems to be like a default, right? That you sort of mm -hmm. go to these days. It's, it's certainly uh, the vehicle, the mechanism to reach the largest number of people, right? Uh, in a given click or, you know, obviously in a, in a given post. Um, but it can't be the only thing. Like I tell my staff all the time, like, you know, uh, it, it's not enough to send an email, right? Mm -hmm. If you want something, right? For sure. And I, we're, we're, we're a funder and, and I'm in, always sometimes amazed how people will, will request money from me by sending me an email, right? And it, and I'm like, yeah, that's not going to cut it, right? Like I, if you send me an email asking me for money, whatever that is, right, uh, I'm likely not going to give that to you, right? If you pick up the phone now, or even better, if you actually come see me in person and say, let's go have lunch, right, let's go, let's, let's meet for coffee, I am much more likely to support uh, you than, than not, right? I always say, like, you know, try to get a meeting because it's harder to say no, right, in person than, mm -hmm. than it is over, over an email. And certainly I think the same applies to social media. Clearly we need to do social media and we need to be smart and strategic about it. It allows us to reach a wide audience, but that's in of itself it's not enough. Right. Um, for Puerto Rico, I mentioned Lin Manuel Miranda briefly. Uh, it was really important for us to have an ambassador that could speak about our work mm -hmm. in a real personal way. Lin Manuel's father, uh, Luis Miranda, was our founding president, right? And he grew up basically working at the Hispanic Federation. And so this was something that was deeply personal to him. Right. Right? He knew the organization uh, from its onset till now and could say with a great deal of assurity, like, hey, this is a, a trustworthy organization, and I'm putting my whole name behind this organization. Having that ambassador, you're not always going to be able to get a Lin Manuel, clearly, right? But having ambassadors, right? Uh, it could be the, you know, like let's say my grandmother where, where I was growing up was like the person that everybody turned to in the town. Having that person, right? Let's say if you were in El Paso, Texas, or you were anywhere in the United States, having that person validate your work is really important. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know, you know, uh, Abuelita Fernandez, like we know her, if she says like, hey, this makes sense, we're going to go ahead and do that. And so I think that that is important. I think, again, this is going to be a reoccurring theme. It's all relational. It's all personal. And, and it, philanthropy, I think, giving is like that, period, but much more so in the Latino community. Mm -hmm. And it takes time. Yeah, it takes um, time. I guess one of the problems right. is that people want to rush this process right. of uh, the trustworthiness, mm -hmm. and you don't, you lose trust overnight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you don't build trust overnight. Right. Right. And so I think one of the problems is when we're trying to rush this job so that you can have your results in the next quarter, um, you could end up doing harm to the relationship mm -hmm. um, because it does take time. You have to show that you're in it for the long term right. because uh, folks have been... Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's yeah. a question of authenticity, of credibility, right, of trust. Right. And I would say that, you know, those of uh, the, the folks that are on the line now that are on the phone, if you run a Latino-led, Latino-focused uh, organization, right, you have that because you have been focused very much uh, in a localized way in that community for a very period for a long period of time, that you have built in capital mm -hmm. to be able to do this work. And if you haven't done it, then you got you then you need to do it, you right? Partner right. Up. Because the, the 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 very notion of when we, we talk briefly about parachuting into communities mm -hmm. doesn't work. I mean it doesn't work in any community, will not work in the Latino communities, nor should it, right? right. Uh, there has to be credibility in, in your voice and what you do to be able to ask people from the community to right. support right. The, those efforts. Right. So in the same way, it's, it's similar to just traditional philanthropy. When you meet with a, with a, a donor that you want to court for your nonprofit, right. you're going to take them out, you know, him or her out to lunch and to dinner, and we'll spend a significant amount of time, months, you know, maybe even up to a year, courting that donor to get a return. It's the same thing with 
Latino communities, with any community really, you have to build that trust, you have cool. to put in that time. Cool. And partner up with a validator, an affirmator. And we have plenty of those. Yeah. For example, Hispanic Federation, right. uh, Hispanics in Philanthropy. We have other partners all across the country, so you can reach out to us and we, you can ask us, what should we be doing? If you tell me that you're working in Georgia, I'm going to tell you, go talk to Gigi Pedraza. If you tell me that you're working in Arizona, I'm going to tell you to talk to the Latina Giving Circle there in California. You know, So really reach out to us and use us as resources. Right. So identify those established organizations like Hispanics and Philanthropy, like Hispanic Federation, like the Latino Community Foundation in San Francisco. They're already entrenched in the community and can help you build those bridges exactly. a lot faster. Yeah. Correct. Um, Let's, let's go to diversity. Uh, some, one of our uh, audience members raised this question. I think it's a great question. Um, there's, you know, we cannot deny that there is a diverse spectrum that this word Latino, you know, encompasses, right? Um, historically, Afro-Latinos and indigenous Latinos, so to speak, um, have struggled to feel represented within this umbrella, as have the LGBTQ Latinx community, right? Is this something that Latinx uh, philanthropy, the La Latino giving, is addressing, um, and if so, how? Absolutely. I think that's right, because Latinos come in all colors, not mm -hmm. just indigenous Black, you have Jewish, you have Muslim, mm -hmm. you have um, you have a quite a large number of disabled mm -hmm. uh, Latinos. Right. You know, exactly. disabilities is often forgotten and is not on the radar. So we do have to recognize the breadth of all of our abilities and all you know mm -hmm. colors and shades. I, I like how Jose talks about people of color because it looks at you know the whole spectrum mm -hmm. um, and. At HIP, we do pay attention to that. If you come to our conferences, you'll see how we um, incorporate all ethnicities. We've been talking about equity at the center and centering uh, race, ethnicity, and access and opportunities. There's a great organization, which I'm on the steering committee of, mm -hmm. um, which is Change Philanthropy, which is looking at the intersection uh, of all of these things. Um, really. You were talking about diversity. I don't usually talk about diversity because I think that that's such a low bar just to have people in the room of the right color. That really doesn't get me very excited mm. because the thing is that the people have to have the influence and the voice. Mm. That's where the equity and mm. the inclusion, yes. right? So you'll have me much more interested if you're talking with that angle. Just checking off uh, that you have people in the room if they don't really have a voice and influence in the process. But Change Philanthropy is working on that. They have a mm -hmm. conference every year. Mm -hmm. For those people that are on the West Coast, the next conference is going to be in the fall of 2019 mm -hmm. out in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Last year it was in, um, in New Orleans. And it's a really powerful table looking at all of these intersections because you're right. Mm -hmm. If you just look at one type of Latinos, you're basically perpetuating um, one kind of voice. Exactly. Um, and that doesn't do anybody any help. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are an incredibly diverse people, and and uh, and, and and that's the beauty, I think, of, of our community, right? We uh, certainly uh, represent the, the entire rainbow, right, of ethnicities and races, and uh, you know, just uh, beliefs, right, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, you know, we come from twenty-something odd countries in Latin America, and and bring all those experiences uh, to the table. Oftentimes, uh, you're absolutely right, Julieta. Uh, we uh, don't do a good enough job of highlighting uh, that diversity, right, and, and what that means. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, here at the Federation that uh, uh, we our roots are in New York, right, which is, you know, you can't escape, right, obviously, uh, that diversity. And, and, and for us, uh, I, we had a conversation before this call, um, and we were talking about, right, the elections of 2016 and how we knew at the Federation that right away that we needed to shift the lens from, uh, just a purely Latino lens when we look at education or immigration or we could think about all these other issues to a people of color uh, lens, right? That we needed to be able to, to as we have in the past, uh, but do so even more so now uh, with the African-American community, with the Asian-American community, with Native Americans, with the LGBTQ community and other communities that have been historically disenfranchised and marginalized uh, because we knew and we understand, you know, even more so today uh, that this is a struggle, right, uh, that uh, is very much one that's defined around 
uh, uh, people of color, right? Uh, when we think about, think, just think about immigration for a second, right? Think about what, what uh, this president has done, right? Uh, from the revoking of DACA to the revoking uh, or doing away with TPS. Who did he do away with TPS, right? When you look at El Salvador, uh, when you think about, you know, uh, the, the Senegalese, when you think about the Nepalese, right? When you think about uh, the Haitians, et cetera. Hondureños. yeah. So, I mean, you go on, there's like seven or eight countries. All those countries, right, without question, right, are countries that are, are right, uh, by very definition, people of color, right? And, and, and we understand very much that this social justice struggle that we're going through now uh, has to be looked at through that lens. So everything we do uh, from that moment on, right, everything we have done from that moment on to today is through that lens. We no longer have, you know, a Latino conference, right, um, focused on, let's say, access to health care. Mm -hmm. This is about, again, uh, how does this impact the African-American community, the Asian-American community, and other communities, right, that have been historically uh, marginalized? And, and in the Latino community, and how do we make common calls with them mm -hmm. to change uh, policies, to change obviously the dynamic that is taking place, mm -hmm. and that's really important when we think about philanthropy because I don't, I don't want us to miss the point that I have made earlier, which is in this moment in time that we're in, this is in some ways, uh, you know, and I hate to be dramatic, but you know these are dramatic times. Uh, this is about our, our very survival. This mm -hmm. is we have existential threats uh, that are. are focused on our community, right, uh, that we uh, assume, and we cannot assume that alone, right? We have to make common cause if we're going to survive and thrive as a community. And, and in order for us to be able to do that, we have to raise money and resources to do that, mm -hmm. and we have to bring people to the table. And so I think Latinos do that, by the way, uh, better than others, right? We are, because of our own diversity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are much more comfortable in the diversity space than others are. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact, right? Because we, again, I, we grew up with the rainbows of the world, right, around us, right? Within our own own not families, like, yeah. right? It's not like, oh, you know, my neighbor was African American or was yeah. African was Afro, you know, Cuban. No, no, it's like within my own family, right? Uh, there, are, there is the rainbow of colors yep. within my own families, and so we grew up having to understand that diversity and, and being embracing of that diversity, um, you know, quite often because that's just our reality. And so we are, I believe, uh, natural conveners. We are natural, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, coalition builders, if you will, right. about bringing people to the table because we understand what that diversity is about. Yeah, yeah. We should add, like, for example, even things like the Muslim ban. People don't remember, and we're writing a blog about that. The Muslim ban is our ban too, right? Absolutely, without question. You, you have Venezuela. Our own uh, director for programs is not, like she, her grandma can no longer come visit. These things well, are, yeah. you know, are yeah. they, yeah. do come in different yeah. colors and shapes. One final question uh, for both of you. Maybe you can respond in one or two minutes. Um, let's look into the future. So the year is 2040. What will civic and philanthropy engagement look like for the Latinx community in the U.S., and what needs to happen in order for us to get there? Now, this is a big question for one or two minutes, but <laughs> if you can try. Honestly, what I see for 2040, and that's 22 years away, mm -hmm. I see a vibrant America. I see uh, increasing trends and that democracy will <laughs> to, to steal from the Washington Post will not be dying in the darkness but will actually be having a renaissance and will be increasing. I, I'll see solidarity across all peoples of color and across mainstream America, white people, not the polarization right now that we see where it's so much yelling yet nobody's really listening. Mm -hmm. So I see that coming together. Um, how can we create through lines so that we can see each other, understand each other? For example, <coughs> I've been taking groups of foundation uh, funders to Puerto Rico to see that it's not just somebody else's issue. It's not an other issue. Mm -hmm. You can't, we can't otherize each other. In Puerto Rico, you can go to places um, where you can see where the indigenous communities, where you, where you can see the descendants of the African mm -hmm. slaves. And it's all of us wrapped up there. Uh, in two weeks, I'm taking a group of founders to San Diego to see firsthand the, the border crisis. And you'll see in San Diego, Tijuana, mm -hmm. how it's Cubanos, how it's Haitians, how it's people trying to get in through a legal port of entry mm -hmm. from Haiti from um, Africa, India, China, it affects all of our communities it's in addition to the mm -hmm. um, Mexican and Central Americans that are fleeing violence. So it's really how do we create these through lines so that we can understand each other's histories. Mm -hmm. It's not our fault. Our schools are not set up to teach 
history mm -hmm. in all of its diversity. We mm -hmm. see snippets of history, and we often forget that the lands on which we stand are, you know, lands that were free to us, but that were taken from the Native American mm -hmm. people, that much of our economy is built on free labor mm -hmm. or very cheap labor mm -hmm. that was exploited. And so there are certain um, benefits that have been accrued and then perpetuated mm -hmm. um, in cycles. And so this privilege. And so our economy, I think what we need to see now with the growing inequality um, is really how do we um, start Figuring out how mm -hmm. um, how everybody can have access and opportunity and 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 a leg up, um, the proverbial bootstraps. But we need to give the straps to people. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, you know. I, I so I agree with Anna Maria on, on all those points. I think uh, I would you know. Hopefully we, we don't have to wait till 2040, right, uh, to get to an embrace of who we are. We are a multicultural, multiracial people, right? Mm -hmm. and that's what America is today, uh, and and that's what America will continue to be, and even more so. Uh, as the years progress, uh, we need more justice uh, in America, and, and, and I hope that uh, our country becomes more just. As it becomes more just, it will become more prosperous, right? You cannot uh, continue to perpetuate uh, systems of inequality, right, and expect to be a prosperous country, right, um, and certainly one that, again, uh, will become uh, even more diverse uh, over time. The, the great Dr. King, you know, constantly mm -hmm. Uh, would remind people that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I would love for us to finally yeah. be there, right, mm -hmm. to the point where uh, there is uh, justice when we think about yeah. education, when we think about health care, when we think about uh, economic opportunity and so many other things. We have a long ways to go. I think the work we do today is critically important to get us uh, to that point. Uh, in some ways, we have lost our way, uh, but America is about cycles, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are very much... Uh, still struggling to uh, live up to those founding ideals that this country was created on. Uh, but it makes, you know, I was taught as an, as an immigrant to this country, my parents would say, you know, don't rock the boat. Mm -hmm. Like you're here, you should just be grateful that you're yeah. here. And I, and I realized in short order that uh, we were being un-American by being quiet and being silent, that in mm -hmm. fact, that we were part of America's continuum. And in order to make America uh, stronger and better, uh, that we needed to be able to lift up our voices and right. we needed to make America uh, everything that it should be. And and, and I think uh, more people are starting to understand that now than ever before. And, and the exciting part about what's happening today is that we're seeing our young people in particular, mm -hmm. right, taking the mantle of leadership, right, when it comes to, you know, the Parkland kids, when we think about our, our, our DACA students, right, our dreamers, and so many uh, in so many other instances that it is our young people that are leading the way. And that holds great promise, I think, for the country. I think it certainly uh, holds great promise for the movement. And uh, let's hope we can get to a better place uh, well before 2040, but certainly yeah. by 2040 that, uh, you know, we, we do see uh, justice, uh, you know, in the same breath as, as, as being prosperous, right? Yeah, thank you so much, Jose. Sure. Uh, we have questions just pouring in, which is so exciting. We've had a very lively conversation, so we were we will now get to the questions. Um, one of our uh, our first question comes from Victoria, and Victoria asks if Latino nonprofits are under resourced, and in general the Latino population is more likely to be in the middle or low income. How then will Latino serving nonprofits become financially at par without the support of traditional Caucasian givers who institutionally give at a higher rate than Latinos? Um, Ana Maria or Jose, would either of you yeah. want to take that question? Yeah, let me start. Um, and, and it's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I, I think one of the things that, that's really important that we practice and we believe is, is self-determination, right? We, we believe that, um, you know, we need to be able to raise uh, resources from our community up by and for the community. I think that's really important. And that does not take away in any way, right? Uh, also the responsibilities that others have to support our communities, right? Uh, and we need to hold their feet to the fire where, when it comes to traditional philanthropy, when we think about the foundation sector, when we think about corporate America, uh, that does you know, incredible business, right, uh, in our community and benefits greatly from, uh, you know, our, our, you know, consumption and sort of obviously our business generally and certainly government. We are 18% of the population of this country and growing. And so when we think about 
addressing the systemic intrinsic problems that we have in the country. When we think about the educational challenges that we have in our community, when we think about the healthcare challenges, when we think about all these other challenges, that has to go through the Latino community, right? You can't avoid tackling those, uh, in some ways, entrenched, intrinsic issues that we have as a country when we think about our very future as a nation without going through the Latino community. So those other sectors, those, uh, you know, traditional sort of uh, philanthropy, they need to be supporting our community in deeper ways. I mean, Ana Marie mentioned only 4%, right, of money that is given out in philanthropy is coming to the Latino community. That's unacceptable on any level. By the way, it's the same thing for the African-American community and the Asian community as well, too. They're just, the, the bars are so low there, right? I mean, and, and really, again, we need to push traditional philanthropy to do more. At the same time, also being able to raise money locally uh, because it makes a huge difference when Ana Marie and I go to the table in philanthropy and we're also givers. So when I go now around the issue of Puerto Rico, for instance, and say, hey, I believe this project is really important and we're willing to put up a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Who's going to match us here, mm -hmm. right? Who's going to go, and, in, in fact, go far and beyond what we're doing? Right. Um, and it gives us power that we right now oftentimes don't have, right? When we can also come to the table as givers ourselves, uh, it makes the case even stronger for us to demand uh, resources come to our community. Right. Yeah. Right. Because you're looking at it as an investment, and so now we're right. co-investing in our country and in our institutions as well. Right. I would add that it's also um, sometimes we want uh, 500 <coughs> or 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 um, dollar donations from one to use the word Caucasian. Um, but it's also a numbers game that you can build up for. So instead of looking for those really huge gifts for one or two individuals start playing like large uh, smaller gifts from a larger number mm -hmm. of people and uh, we're such a young population um, especially addressing like if you target and address the Millennials and be okay with um, a smaller donations but from a broader number of folks that I, I've seen uh, works and that's like the basically the how giving circles work, mm -hmm. right? People putting in $25, $50. Um, uh, we raised the $650,000 from Puerto Rico, and that was mostly $25, $50. So that was a numbers, mm -hmm. um, a numbers play in terms mm -hmm. of... Juliet, I, I would also add, sure. add as well, too, that we have a lot of wealth in the Latino community. Mm -hmm. We have an incredible amount of wealth. We have a lot of Latinos who are, are doing really well, right, mm -hmm. who are, you know, by every definition, wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that we are also engaging them as well, too. So the, the notion that, um, you know, we only have low-income, right, uh, people in our community is also a false one, right? Obviously, yeah. we have uh, a lot of Latinos that are upper middle class, middle class, right, and obviously some uh, that are wealthy. Yeah. Um, and so we, we have, you know, a growing number of Latinos that are earning over 100000 I forget the exact number, but yeah. it's a huge number. And so, again, uh, clearly there's wealth to be tapped into our community. But, again, it's important that uh, everyone does their part to support this vital community for this nation, right? Again, 18%, it'll be uh, well over 20% by the next census. And, and, that, and, you know, we see already with the trend with our young people, right? 25% of, of the, our student population in this country is Latino now, and that number will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And again, if we look at through a people of color lens, so obviously that number is a majority. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, there is a real need to, and it's not hard to make the case. Right. There's just a real need to make the case. Right. Thank you for saying that, Jose. I think changing that perception that we have of our own community, that we're all low income, right. is not, you know, that's, not, that's really important for us to change that perception first Absolutely. and begin to to see the diversity, um, the, the financial diversity that exists within the Latino community. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is from Carol, and Carol asks, could Jose and Ana Mari share, their, um, uh, their, share about their experiences in identifying and attracting Latinx board members? Uh, we found that the same people are tapped by multiple organizations, as many organizations seek to diversify their boards. Um, it, so it's, it's a competitive situation out there. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It's not competitive. It's only competitive because you have the same 20 people that are getting recycled and it's like musical chairs. <laughs> um, but there are so many talented people. I find that if you're looking at, um, for example, a lot of the community foundations have 
representation that is Latino. So I've been encouraging the national foundations to go to the community foundations uh, and basically graduate those uh, trustees into their boards. <coughs> At the community foundation level, I think that we also need to be a little bit um, more flexible uh, because why do we have this ground rule of give or get? Um, you know, there's foundations that represent their community, and I'll give a shout out to uh, Fred over at the San Francisco Foundation that he's like, no, I want the best people on my board, and if you know everybody should be giving, but there's not these these thresholds mm -hmm. um, that are sometimes artificial and really distracting, and so um, I. I Community foundations are the best place to start. We should all be looking at what our community foundations, the composition of those trustees, and demanding, since they're supposed to represent mm. the community, that they, they look like our communities, and then growing those people. Um, we have a, a, a Latino trustees circle, which is doing just that, which is connecting Latino trustees to each other and also increasing the pipeline. And the community foundations, I'll also add, often they get their trustees and they're the feeder uh, from community organizations, uh, grassroots organizations on the ground. So mm -hmm. it's important to make sure that all of these organizations um, are diverse with their trustees because that all then just um, graduates. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would say real quick, thank you, Anna Money. Um, Carol, reach out to us, right, because we, we can help on that front. I mean, we do a lot of around board leadership development mm -hmm. and really particularly getting Latinos on the boards of our groups. We represent over 100 Latino community organizations. But broadly, right, when we think about community foundations or other uh, other nonprofits, um, how do we get Latinos to there? We have certainly a, a huge network of people that are eminently qualified, um, and quite often it's just people don't know who they are, right? And, and so we need uh, the carols of the world, if you will, to be able to reach out so we can start making those connections. Right, right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, our next question is from Yvette and Viviana. Uh, she said, they say, thanks uh, for mentioning small nonprofits that are run by a handful of staff members and many volunteers. What other advice can you give to us for reaching out to Latino philanthropists and donors? Where can we advertise? What types of conferences can we attend? How can we do outreach, et cetera? This would not be for a sudden need like a natural disaster, but rather for an ongoing need used in the juvenile justice and foster care system. Yeah, I mean, so it's critical. Is it Viviana? And yeah. uh, Yvette and Viviana. Yvette Viviana. Thank you for, for that question. And I know it's a struggle, right? We you know, we have all been there, right? I mean, we started and we still represent a large number of organizations that are very small, right, where the executive director is doing mm -hmm. everything, right? Uh, and, you know, it's just one or two staff. I think it's really important uh, to be able to get out there as much as possible. We talked about all giving, right? It's personal, relational, right? And when I became executive director, I can tell you at the Federation, uh, we were a mid-sized organization at that point, and we've grown uh, by leaps and bounds. And part of what I did was like, okay, saying, I, I just did a, sort of this mapping exercise and said, how much money are we getting from government, right? And said, okay, well, who are our friends within government, right? Um, and how do I make the case to get more support? I did the same thing around foundation giving. I said, well, who's actually giving us money around foundations? And I said, oh my God, we're getting like next to nothing here in mm -hmm. terms of foundation dollars. Mm -hmm. I did the same thing around corporate supporters and then, of course, individual givers. And I set out, right? Um, and it was largely me, right? Uh, at this point, because all of our staff were, were focused on programs, and then we had some administrative staff. So, uh, and we had uh, one grant writer at that point. And so, somebody needed to go out there into the universe to just make the case for the organization. And I set out methodically and deliberately. And as Ana Marie said, it, this is not something that happens overnight. Uh, but if you stick with that, right? And, and here in this case, you have two individuals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that if you go out there and you make the case, right, around you know, uh, you know, criminal justice, right, or uh, or, or our youth, right, to give them opportunities, right, uh, to get out of, you know, sort of the, the system, if you will, which is all vitally important. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be going out and saying, okay, how do I reach these foundations? And you need to be relentless about it, by the way, right, um, because so much of this is about perseverance. I remember the Ford Foundation. Uh, it took me almost a year and a half before I, I got an audience, um, uh, you know, at that point with uh, their very senior staff. And then it took another year before they actually funded us at, from getting that point of the audience. 
So it, there, there are no, there's, it's hard to get immediate returns, but you can be, you can rest assured that if you stick with this, obviously your mission is something that you wholeheartedly believe in. And the benefit that I had was that I was a program staff before I became president. And so I knew all of our programs. I was incredibly passionate about the work that we did. And that translated very much the way it will translate with you because you're living and breathing your entire reality. So when you go out there, and you're going to be the best advocate that this organization can ever hope for because you know it, you know, um, you know, top to bottom. It, it's not uh, you are not some ivory tower executive director, right, or staff mm -hmm. that has to be given talking points around mm -hmm. the programs and the work that you do and why your mission is so critically important. So, uh, but there's no substitute of getting out there and having a strategy to really reach those important donors. Right, right. If I might add, yeah, I mean, we have the hip give dot org site h i p give g i v dot o r g mm -hmm. and this is the crowdfunding site and it is meant to not just it, it, it's different from a GoFundMe page because hip believes that we need to provide the platform and also the capacity and the technical assistance so mm -hmm. it gives you the marketing and that capacity and we offer that free so that each organization whether it be the smaller grassroots or the bigger one is able to then put up their site so we help you in terms of what's the visibility what's your story what are the photos um how should they frame it so you should reach out to our staff and have them That's help great. you and we do that for all of the u.s and in uh, mexico and central america mm -hmm. i'm looking at the site right now right now they're doing uh, campaigns on salud for all on health or on human trafficking around the uh, uh, family separation there's lgbtqi there's dreamers mm -hmm. there's scholarship drives and um these are all That's powerful wonderful. and so they help you raise resources, but they also help you in terms of starting to learn how to frame your story. And often, that's right, there's not a development person, and so right. that's that's part of what we're offering. That's great to help with these campaigns. So Yvette and Viviana definitely reach out to Hispanics and Philanthropy. Yeah. <laughs> they offer this great yeah. service for free, which is wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, Latinos in working for corporations and how we can leverage corporate philanthropy, corporate social responsibility programs to reach out to them and engage them in the work that nonprofits are doing? That's another one. I okay. talked about how we we don't have a lot of palanca or pulls <laughs> with private foundations because they're so well insulated. With community foundations, we have palanca. With corporate foundations, we have palanca because we have a huge amount of buying power mm -hmm. and Latinos are very generous, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, very loyal mm -hmm. to their products. Like, I will never, ever buy anything except for Bounty or Charmin, for example, <laughs> right? It's just, my mom taught me that and that's what, what I buy, right? right. And so, um, we're brand loyal. This is not a paid commercial. Yeah. It's, not, it's like my mother, I hope like, funny. and yeah. that's my, my daughter also knows that these are, like, yeah. but um, how do we then, um, but we could, like mm -hmm. pull, right? If somebody told me, I mean, how many of us switch from Uber to Lyft, right? We can, as a community, also um, pull our funding, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that it would hurt. And so uh, we have to start using that in more effective ways. We've had boycotts in terms of like a day without an immigrant, and actually I, I was in New Mexico when we had that last year, and everything was closed. Mm -hmm. That was powerful. Uh, I think that we need to understand how to use our buying power in um, even mm -hmm. more stronger ways to send the, that message because um, our economy would be drastically affected. The Latino Donor Collaborative last year did a great spread on the Washington, uh, no, no, Wall Street Journal that talked about if all immigrants were to leave overnight, we would lose 12% of our economy. Sure. Um, we would lose our strawberries and our lettuce. We would not have anybody really, um, you know, our housing stock would would suffer because of the construction industry. It would be it would be a strong impact. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, let, let me say, you know, and and I think uh, I agree with Ana Maria. I think a lot of this is um, how do we think uh, how do we think strategically around creating greater access uh, 
for our community groups, right? At the end of the day, that's who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That the ERG, uh, Ulieta groups, uh, create a great opportunity for us to, to engage from the inside, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you always want to talk about access, right? Because if you're knocking from the outside, it's a whole different story as opposed mm -hmm. to being let in. Uh, we have a growing number of Hispanic employees in all these major uh, Fortune 500 companies. They don't even have to be Fortune 500 companies, but just businesses. Uh, and, and many of them are really super organized. And so uh, a lot of them are focused around volunteer opportunities, right? They engage us constantly. And what we have done, right, and we are still trying to do, is educate them that, okay, the volunteer opportunities are great, right? And, you know, we want you to come and help us, you know, paint this house, right, or construct uh, you know, again, uh, the structure, et cetera, et cetera. But we also need you to give. Mm -hmm. We need you to personally give, right? We also need you to write a check, right? Whether it's $100, $50, whatever you can do, do that. But we also need you to be effective ambassadors for our organization. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think many of us have our, that traditional chicken dinner gala, whatever the event <laughs> ends up being, and we try to raise, you know, general op money, unrestricted dollars, and a lot of that is made up of, of corporate dollars, right, of, of corporate supporters. It is critically important that you get these ERG groups, if, if you have access to them, to be able to make the case internally. Um, can you explain what yeah. ERG is? Oh, I'm sorry, the employee resource groups. Thank you. Yeah, so the employee, I'm sorry, and, and they may have other names for it, the Hispanic employee resource groups, right? So, uh, you know, all these, specifically at the major uh, companies, will have employee resource groups that are affiliated around sort of uh, their diversity platform and the Latino community, LGBTQ community, right, uh, African American, et cetera, et cetera. And they're, in this case, Latino ERG groups, Latino employees that gather around to support Latino causes. Mm -hmm. And again, they, they've been constructed largely around doing volunteer events, right? Mm -hmm. And what we have been trying to sort of push them around is like, okay, that's great, and we're gonna help you with that, but we also need you to be uh, donors, right, mm -hmm. to our organizations, and we also need you mm -hmm. to make the case, if you're working at J.P. Morgan Chase, and you mentioned, let's say bounty, right, since <laughs> Anna Marie mentioned bounty, it's charm. My bounty. There you go. <laughs> so if, if you work at bounty, and you're, you have a Latino you know, uh, employee resource group, and that group, whether let's say it's, uh, there's 100 people, they should be donors. Right. They can also serve as a pool for board members, right, uh, for our groups, and that's really important, but they also need to be ambassadors, right, within the companies to say, our company needs to do more to support Hispanic causes, Latino causes across uh, across our footprint. And here are some groups, right, mm -hmm. that we now have. And so it's a great connection to make uh, that can give in so many ways the volunteer opportunity uh, to have a board member, but also to be those effective advocates within the organization so that they can better support uh, your programs, they can better support your dinners, they can better support your events. Etc. And we've used them, uh, I think, to great effect now where we have, you know, certain companies that are now coming in and doing more mm -hmm. because the employee network is saying, well, no, we should be doing more, right. you know, and, and this is an organization that is vital not only to uh, the vibrancy of our community, but to the vibrancy of this city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, many organizations, the entry point is volunteerism. They have robust volunteers. We gotta push them beyond that, yeah. So we have to yeah. we have to take that, um, but and push mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and go beyond that. Yeah. But that's the first entry point. So we just need to be understanding of that. That right, and, and that's the framework that that corp corporations will have. Mm -hmm. But we have to push them beyond that because it's also an incredible amount of work for us to manage those volunteers, right? And, and many of our groups don't have the infrastructure to be able to do it, uh, but there has to be that point of connection, right? Anna Marie mentioned mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, you have them come in, uh, you, you do something with them, but then now you gotta go beyond that. Right, right. Um, let's, let's switch over to giving, uh, giving circles, excuse me. So Michelle has a question here. Uh, what are some practical strategies and activities that a giving circle can do to support and deepen civic engagement, in particular small and emerging giving circles. Uh, Anna Marie, would you like to speak to that? Um, what do you think? Well, look, I, I think you know. Uh, I'm going to go back to the sort of the time, the time that we're in right now. I think it's it, it, it's very. Uh, it's much easier to make the case today, right, about the importance of, of civic engagement, right? Mm -hmm. You know, during the last election, those of you that stayed home, right, or those of us that know people that stayed home and, you know, the impact that that had, right, uh, in terms of the results. Uh, the, in order to do this work, and it's, we know we have a map, right, for instance, we do a lot of civic engagement. Mm -hmm. It costs us about $20 to register a voter. 
uh, it costs us about thirty something dollars to stay engaged with that with that person that we registered. Right? We want to make sure that we do voter education around uh, issue based. Uh, you know, um, priorities for us, right? So whether, hey, we believe in climate change, we think that climate change is real, mm-hmm. and we want to educate people around why we think that that's real and the impact that that has on their lives. We believe in universal health care. We think that that's important for our community and, and our families, and we educate voters around sort of those platforms. In order to do that work, it costs resources to be able to do it. So a giving circle that is very much focused on, let's say, Latino voter mobilization uh, will understand Okay, here's a budget, right? If we want to reach X number of people, this is what it will cost us to be able to do that, right? So if we want to reach a thousand people and it costs us twenty dollars, right, per to reach a thousand people to register a thousand people, mm-hmm. well, that's twenty thousand dollars we have to raise. Mm-hmm. So the math is very clear. I think the budget is very clear, mm-hmm. um, and you can see the direct impact that that has. And you can be involved also from a volunteer standpoint of registering people. You can go and, and we can go and you can be that foot soldier, right, where you, you're, you're a canvasser in community. You can do do the door knocking, uh, which makes it even more rewarding, right? Mm-hmm. So not, o- not only am I raising money, but I'm actually going out and doing that in the communities uh, that I care about with others, like other like-minded people yeah. at the same time. So I think the moment is beyond right to do more of that work, right, and to have Giving Circles serve as a vehicle to really drive that work. Yeah. I would say that it makes sense to assemble your Giving Circle partners and to raise your money to your point earlier about if you go as an investor. Mm-hmm. So if we've raised $20,000 with our Giving Circle members mm-hmm. um, and you go to the Community Foundation or you go to the United Way and you say, we want to start this circle, match us with this amount of money mm-hmm. and uh, also provide us with the infrastructure and a staff person mm-hmm. to, to, to manage this mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, going as... Um, if you've done your homework and get that infrastructure done and get your commitments lined up, mm-hmm. that's, that's I mm-hmm. think, critical. Mm-hmm. And then, Marie Jose, thank you so much for joining me today here. Uh, we've had an incredible conversation, and I just want to reiterate uh, both uh, Hispanic Federation as well as Hispanics and Philanthropy offer great resources for Latino nonprofit organizations and for Latino professionals working in the social sector. So if you are interested um, either in becoming a board member or becoming either a program officer or a leader of a larger uh, philanthropic institution, do reach out to Hispanic uh, Hispanics and Philanthropy's leadership program. If you're interested in finding um, board members, that can serve your cause, reach out to Hispanic Federation. Um, They're there to support you. Uh, Before we close, I just want to say that um, next month we are going to have Yolanda uh, Caldera Durant, who is part of Fund the People. She will be leading a discussion with uh, Elizabeth Kidd, Vice President of Community Impact for the Community Foundation of the Holland Zealand area. And we will also be joined by Latoya Booker, who's the executive director of Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance on how funder talent investments can increase effectiveness, equity and inclusion, performance, impact, and sustainability in nonprofits, and how to bake it into your work. Uh, So you can register now uh, through Grantspace. In September, we're going to have Dorian Burton. Uh, Brian Barnes and their colleagues will discuss the importance of redirecting philanthropic investments for justice-oriented collective action and impact and how that translates in the real world. Uh, We will be having a a special focus on the African-American communities across the U.S. Um, You will have the opportunity to learn about the seven elements of the paid and full investment strategy and how to apply this approach to your work. Uh, Make sure to claim your spot early. Um, Don't forget, if you cannot attend any of our live webinars, you will always get a recording so you can watch it on your own time. Uh, and uh, with that, I, again, I just want to thank Ana Mari and, and Jose um, and everyone that joined us today for our webinar. Uh, rest assured that you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar, as well as a short survey. We do ask you, I beg you, <laughs> please respond to our survey. Uh, it helps us so much, especially when it comes to securing funding for these types of programs that we're able to bring to you for free. Um, we hope to be able to uh, to continue our diversity, equity, and inclusion series next year, and your survey uh, responses will be incredibly important for that. Um, 
I also encourage you to continue visiting Foundation Center's Racial Equity Portal, which is home for all racial equity and DEI resources produced by Foundation Center. So with that, on behalf of Foundation Center and our presenters today, again, thank you so much for joining us. If you like this webinar, we hope that you will join us again soon. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Anamari, Jose, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Gracias.